I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. We're continuing our series called Just Jesus. We're looking at the Gospel of Luke, and specifically right now, we're looking at life changes, life-changing encounters with Jesus. Uh, If you don't have a Bible with you or an app on your device, I'm going to invite you to take one of the Pew Bibles that look just like this. And turn to page 1095, you will find the Gospel of Luke chapter 5. And if you don't have a Bible like this, and uh, then use the table of contents. That's why God put them in there. So, uh, you know, uh, we just want you to find it. Hey, while you're uh, turning to Luke 5, uh, let me just tell you about an opportunity that exists for a lot of us. If you are a resident of Arizona and you're paying Arizona state income tax, you have an opportunity to support kids in schools. Uh, There's public tax credit uh, where your dollars can go to, your tax dollars can go to help kids in sports activities or extracurricular stuff, uh, which is a great opportunity. There's also one for Christian schools. Uh, And we partner with an organization called uh, Arizona Christian School Tax Organization. And, uh, and you, if you're going to pay state income taxes, you can direct some of that money to help kids in Christian schools, help pay their tuition. It doesn't go to the schools. It goes to the, goes to the children. And uh, if you're interested in that and taking advantage of that opportunity, uh, I would love for you to grab one of the brochures on the way out. It's on the, the wall on the left. Or check out the information in the bulletin. Send you to their website. Uh, because we have a Christian school here, Calvary Christian Academy. It's a great school, about 170 students. And we would love for you to help some of them be able to afford that Christian education and shape their life. So it's an opportunity that exists. I would hate for you to miss out on the chance to be able to bless some kids, uh, either in the public schools or in Christian schools. Now, that said, uh, do you like surprises? It's interesting. I, had, I heard yeses and nos and maybes all over the place. Uh, you know, I've noticed that in life, surprises are part of it. You can't get away from it. Some are good, some are not. So if you walk out in the morning and you have a flat tire or a dead battery, good surprise, bad surprise. Yeah, frustrates you, doesn't it? You're like, ah, oh, rats. On the other hand, if you're, uh, you know, buying your Starbucks or, or at a restaurant and someone picks up your check, what kind of surprise is that? Yeah, you're kind of excited about that, <laughs> you know. If, uh, you know, you walk into work and they tell you they're downsizing you, you know, that uh, you're being laid off, uh, let go, or you're fired, it's not really a good surprise. On the other hand, if you get a call offering you a job, great surprise. Uh, or maybe, you know, uh, Havasu's finest, you know, uh, lights you up. <laughs> Want to have a personal conversation. That is not a good feeling in that moment. But on the other hand, if they just walk up and tell you your taillight's busted and you need to fix it, really good feeling in that moment. Maybe the doctor's office calls and says they need to see you. Not really a good feeling, is it? And you get there and they tell you that you overpaid and here's a refund check. Yeah, some of you are like, that's not a surprise, that's a miracle. (laughs) Speaking of miracles, what do you think when your teenager comes up to you and says, Mom, Dad, I just want to tell you, you are wonderful parents. (laughs) Yeah, there's a lot of skepticism here, isn't there? (laughs) Some of you are like, that's not a surprise, that's like, what do you want? Uh, Today we are looking at a story of surprises. Uh, Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse 17. If you grew up in church, then this story is familiar to you. And sometimes that is a disadvantage because we don't see it with fresh eyes. If you didn't grow up in church, uh, then this is going to be a really cool story that, that uh, we're going to look at today. One of my favorites. But whatever the case, as I read this, as you follow along, I want you to look at it from the eyes of surprise. What are the things that happen that are unexpected, that are out of the ordinary, that you'd go, wow, I didn't see that coming? So here's the story. On one of those days, as Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. 
And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he'd been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all and they glorified God and were filled with awe saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. This is a story of surprises. Uh, Think about it. You know, there's Jesus in this house. It's probably a larger house. Lots of people gathered there to listen to him teach. Most of them are religious leaders, Pharisees and teachers of the law, who've come because they want to check Jesus out. Here's this guy who's healing people, who's teaching to large crowds. We got to go and see if he's, uh, if he's a good teacher, if he's kosher, if he's real. And so these guys come bringing a paralyzed man to Jesus because they've heard Jesus is in the house. Jesus can heal him. We're going to get him healed today. We're going to see Jesus change his life. And so they bring him to Jesus, but they can't get in. Surprise, you're blocked. And, and, and by the way, this is one of those surprises that the, the first hundred times or so I read the story, I, I kind of missed. The rudeness, the selfishness of that crowd was astounding. Wasn't it? I mean, here these guys come bringing a, a man who's paralyzed, and Jesus is a few feet away in the house, and everybody there knows Jesus can heal this guy. And what do they do? Come back later, it's crowded. You talk about selfishness. Now think about this. Most of the people in the house were religious leaders, and they didn't give up their seats for a guy who needed to get to Jesus. That's a picture of selfish religiosity. People who cared more about themselves than they did about people who needed to get to Jesus. That's just amazing. It just shocked me as I I was reading this again. I went, wow, I never saw that before. But that's exactly what happened. So these guys are told, you can't get to Jesus. Well, they didn't give up. So they said, hey, let's go to the roof. Let's cut a hole in the roof. Let's drop the guy down into the crowd. Surprise. (laughs) Can you imagine if you're the owner of that house? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And then the guy's laying there, and Jesus doesn't say what is expected, right? Because he's supposed to say, be healed, but he doesn't. He just says, your sins are forgiven. And that surprises, actually freaks out all the religious leaders because they go, he can't do that. That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus surprises them again because basically what he says is, I want you to know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Says, I want you to understand the Son of Man, Jesus, standing here before you is God in the flesh. I can forgive sins. You're right. Only God can forgive sins. I can forgive sins. And then he heals the man. Take up your bed and walk. And he does just that. And shocks everybody. This is a a surprising story, and, and, and it's an amazing story. And here's my prayer today. I pray that Jesus surprises you. I pray today that as I preach or as we sing or as you leave, that somehow, someway, God surprises you. Uh, Now, I want us to look at two major surprises in this story, two things that I think shape the, the whole rest of the events. The first surprise is the miracle of forgiveness. Now, some of you are thinking, I thought the miracle was a paralytic got healed. Because that's what my Bible says right here above the story. Jesus heals a paralytic. And yeah, that happened. And yeah, that's a miracle, and that's really cool, uh, especially for the guy who was laying there on the bed. But the real miracle, the healing happened because of the miracle of forgiveness. And a lot of times we forget how incredible, how awesome, how wonderful being forgiven really is. I mean, Jesus came into this world to forgive us of our sins so that we could have eternal life, so that we could, uh, so that we could go to heaven when we die. I, I mean, he came to redeem us, to change us, and that all starts with forgiveness. And so the miracle happens because of forgiveness. And I want you to just, just think about this for the next few minutes, that how incredible God's forgiveness for you is. That God wants to forgive you of all your sins. 
That's what scripture says. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to purify us of all unrighteousness. But to really appreciate the miracle of forgiveness, we need to understand that sin causes our brokenness. Sin causes our brokenness. By the way, when I say it causes our brokenness, it causes all of our brokenness. We live in a sin-damaged world. And sin is the root cause of everything that goes wrong in it. Uh, Romans 5.12, the Apostle Paul says, Just as sin came into the world through one man, talking about Adam, and death came through sin, so death spread to all because all sinned. Our world is damaged and broken because of sin. And we're affected by sin in three different ways. We're affected by uh, our sin. We are broken by our sin, by our choices. My life is shattered by my choices, my selfishness, my self-destructive habits, uh, the things that I choose to do to rebel against God. And the same is true in your life. We reap what we sow. And so our lives are broken by our sin, but we are also broken by the sin of others. It's not just us that are, that are in this world that are sinning. And the people around us that are close to us are damaging our lives by their choices, their actions. Whether it is abuse or betrayal or deceit or dishonesty or even just something as simple and stupid as drunk driving. We're, we're broken by other sin and we are broken by random sin. You know, we, we can't see the cause and effect of it, but it's because this world is broken by sin that we have flawed genetics we have disease, we have natural disasters, we have accidents, we have institutional evil. Stuff that happens and affects every one of us that there's no direct cause or effect other than the fact that we're living in a sin-damaged world. And, and usually when we're in the midst of that, we're kind of asking the question, why does God let me be broken? Why, why do I have to experience the brokenness of sin? And, and, and usually it kind of comes out in our questions such as, why me? Why me? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening now? Why is this occurring? I, I, I know you guys don't ask that, but I do. You know, I, 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 we all struggle with that. We all, you know, fight those feelings of why is this going on? So let me try to explain it to you in a way that, that uh, hopefully will make sense and hopefully will, we'll, you know, just burn a picture in your mind that you can't forget even though you want to. Um, let's just say that the world is a a giant swimming pool, okay? God created the world. God created this giant swimming pool, and he put Adam and Eve into his perfect, wonderful swimming pool, and he had one rule, same rule that you have at your pool, don't pee in it. <laughs> right? I mean, you got to go to the bathroom, get out of the pool. And Adam and Eve did that for a little while, but eventually they decided they're going to pee in the pool. And you know what? They didn't just pee in the pool either. They pooped in the pool as well. <laughs> It's gross, but it's a big pool. They just swam away from it. No big deal. Except that they had kids, and their kids had kids, and their kids had kids, and, and pretty soon we're all in the pool. And guess what? We're all following their example. We don't get out every time. Nope, every one of us has peed in the pool. Every one of us has pooped in the pool, all right? And we're no longer living in a big swimming pool, but we're swimming in a cesspool. It's kind of gross, isn't it? But it's reality. And every now and then, if you're swimming in a cesspool, well, you're going to run into poo, all right? <laughs> it's going to happen. It's going to be yours. It's going to be the people close to you. But every now and then, something's going to float by. You don't know where it came from. <laughs> and it's going to hit you because poo happens, okay? And that's a picture of our world that we're living in. And it's broken, it's disgusting, it's damaged because of sin. Ours, yours, everybody's, from the beginning of time. Sin causes our brokenness, and forgiveness changes our lives. Forgiveness changes our lives. Pick up the story, Luke, uh, Luke 5, 23, where Jesus says, what's easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, pick up your bed and go home. And he did. Jesus forgave his sin. Jesus healed his brokenness. And this man's life was radically and completely changed. 
He was surprised. He didn't expect that. And Jesus demonstrated his power to forgive, to heal, to restore by altering a paralytic's life. And understand, he did it for his audience. He was surrounded by religious leaders who thought they knew all the answers. And Jesus wanted to surprise them and say, you don't get this. Forgiveness is the miracle. Forgiveness changes everything. And I have the authority to forgive you. I have the authority to forgive this man. And Jesus, in his forgiveness, set him free from his bondage. I mean, this guy had been attached to his bed for his whole life. I mean, his bed was his prison. He ate in his bed. He slept in his bed. He worked from his bed. Because what they do is they set him on the side of the road and he'd beg for, for money. Everywhere he went, he was attached to that bed. It was the symbol of his brokenness. And Jesus changed all that. Don't you love how the story ends? This guy's brought in on a bed that is his prison, but at the, after meeting Jesus, he now is carrying his bed out. And I just imagine him walking by all those people who wouldn't let him in. Excuse me, Jesus is cool. Get out of my way. <laughs> See this, my bed. I was coming in, you wouldn't let me in? Anyway. Yeah, his life was altered forever. Jesus gave him a new way to live, and it all starts with forgiveness. And the miracle of forgiveness is this. Jesus can give you a new way to live. And it all starts with forgiveness. When you receive the mercy from Jesus that he offers to all of us. You say, how do I do that? By believing that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world. By believing that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, your brokenness. By believing that he was raised from the dead and by placing your faith in him and saying, I'm going to follow Jesus with my life. When we do that, scripture tells us that we are forgiven of all our sins. All of our sins. Ah, well, you know, there's danger if, you know, you tell people they're forgiven. At least the churches I grew up in, they kind of live that out. Well, we're forgiven, but don't tell people they got too much forgiveness because then they'll just go out and, and send some more. You know what the reality is? I don't think people want to live in prison any longer. I don't think there's one of us in this room that wants more pain, more brokenness in our lives. What we really want is Jesus to change our lives, to heal us, and, and so that we can live differently. And that's what he offers to us. So today, what's your symbol of brokenness and bondage? The paralytic symbol of his brokenness was his bed. What's your symbol of your brokenness? Is it a bottle of vodka or a case of beer? Maybe it's prescription pills. Maybe it's an obsession with sex or anger and rage that's just seething inside of you. Maybe your symbol of brokenness is your job or your money or a title or maybe it's an identity as a victim. Whatever your brokenness, Jesus offers healing. Whatever your pain, Jesus is offering you forgiveness and mercy. That's where it begins. So do you want to be free? Do you want a new life? Then today I pray that Jesus surprises you with forgiveness. Because no matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done or how you failed, Jesus loves you and he forgives you if you ask him. It'll change your life because it's a life-changing miracle. I pray today you know the miracle of forgiveness. And, And then the second surprise is the power of faith. The power of faith. This is a story of faith, but it comes in kind of a surprising place. You see, the faith in this story is demonstrated by the men who brought the paralytic to Jesus. And we don't know who these guys are. We don't know anything about them. We don't know where they're from. In fact, they are the unnamed heroes in the story. They just did all this really cool stuff, and and they had faith that was powerful. And and I want you to to see a, a couple of things about their faith. First of all, their faith was powerful because it was a visible faith. A visible faith. All right, my favorite verse in this story is verse 20. And, and, and it just simply says, And when Jesus saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. When Jesus saw their faith, 
He saw the faith of these men. How did Jesus see their faith? Their actions. It's what they did. Their faith became visible because of what they did. I pretty much figured out there's basically three types of people when it comes to faith. And every one of us fits in one of these categories. There are people who don't believe. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in his power to change their life. And you have some on the extreme of the atheists who deny that God even exists. And you have all the way over to people who are kind of seeking and checking out, you know, hey, is God real? Is Jesus real? Can I trust him? Can I follow him with my life? If you're in that category, we are delighted that you are here. And then, second group is the, those who say they believe, who declare their faith. Do you know about 75 to 80% of America says they believe in God? That's declarative faith, something that they say they believe. And then there are those who live what they believe, a visible faith. You and God need to have a conversation about which category you're living in. But honestly, do you have to tell people that you're a follower of Jesus? Have you ever told somebody you're a Christian and they were surprised? <laughs> you're a Christian? No way. <laughs> you go to church? I don't believe it. You see, if we desire lives that are powerful for Christ's kingdom then we will live our faith way beyond bumper stickers and social media. Is your faith evident to those who know you best? Is your faith evident to anyone? These men's faith was visible and it was a determined faith. A determined faith. Uh, these guys uh, are just amazing. Think about all the things they did. Uh, first of all, they were bringing a paralytic to Jesus. That's work. You ever tried to carry somebody who was dead weight? And okay, they got a bed. Well, they got a, you know, a bunch of guys are carrying them. We don't know how far they had to carry him. Was it a half mile? Was it a mile? Was it 10 miles? It doesn't matter. They, they brought this guy to Jesus. And they get there and the crowd says, nope, can't get to Jesus. We're not giving up our spots. And they don't give up. I mean, they could have just gone, hey, we're going to leave you here. Jesus has got to leave the house at some time. Maybe he'll step over you. Maybe he'll heal you. No, they've got one of the guys in the group who's creative. Now, these guys are usually dangerous. You've all got friends like this. Maybe some of you are this guy. He says, uh-uh, we're not going to just leave him here. I got this idea. Right? Let's go up on the roof. Let's take it apart, and let's put him down through the roof. And the guy's like, are you serious? He's like, yeah, we can do it. Trust me. Now, hopefully, they had, like, stairs up onto the roof because a lot of times uh, with no air conditioning, they'd go up on, on the roofs at night, and that's where they would be cool. And so hopefully they had some stairs. But even then, carrying a paralytic upstairs is hard. But what if they didn't have stairs? What if they used ladders? <laughs> Not easy. Either way. But they get up there, and then they start taking apart the roof. There's tiles. They're taking apart. they got to fix this when they're done. Of course, that guy's like, oh, we can fix it. Trust me. I know how. I mean, this may cost them money. I mean, in today's world, they get arrested for criminal trespassing and, you know, vandalism. But they take the, the roof off, and then they got to lower the guy to Jesus. Now, they don't have rigging. You know, they don't have a basket to put him in and a winch to let him down or anything. I mean, they got to figure out how to lower him. I mean, what are they doing? Duct taping this guy to the bed so he doesn't fall out? You know, the paralytics probably, guys, be careful. And there's one guy in the group, you know, he's going, hey, dude, we're just going to throw you down there because you're paralyzed now anyway. I mean, it can't hurt you that much more. And besides, Jesus can raise the dead too. Here we go. I don't know. I might have been that guy. But uh, I'm just impressed because these guys overcame obstacle after obstacle after obstacle to live out their faith and get their friend to Jesus. A couple of observations about them. They were motivated by their faith in Jesus to change lives. They said, hey, if we get our friend to Jesus, Jesus is going to change his life. Therefore, we will do whatever it takes to get him to Jesus. See, when we believe that Jesus will really change someone's life, we will do whatever it takes to get him there. Won't we? It's when we stop believing in Jesus' power to change lives that we stop trying. They believed, so they got him there. And then they didn't do this alone. I, 
I love the story because they brought him to Jesus. Some men came carrying a paralytic. Some men let him down. When Jesus saw their faith, and and I love this because I grew up in in, uh, the kind of church that didn't celebrate the they as much as they did the I. And and if you grew up in this kind of church too, then then you'll know what I'm talking about. If not, you can just listen in. But, But I was told that I had to share my faith very personal. I had to share my faith. I had to lead my friends to Jesus. Uh, I had to be a soul winner. And it was all about the I. And the people who were good at it, well, they were like the stars of the church. They were the super spiritual people. But there were a lot of us, myself included, who felt like a failure trying to serve God because I wasn't any good at doing that whole, you know, soul winning thing. And I'm not sure that we did uh, represent the Bible very well in that model because it's not about I, it's about us. Because the truth is we are the body of Christ. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you're part of it. And we are the body of Christ and we are gifted to be the body of Christ. And we all have different gifts and different uh, makeups and in in, in skills and all that kind of stuff. And we together serve our community so that we together can share the faith of Jesus and we can represent Jesus to Lake Havasu City. And so we serve people and we share faith and we, we lead people to Jesus and we see lives changed. It's about we. It's not about me. It's about us together representing Christ in this community. And last year together, we saw more than 100 people confess Jesus as Savior and Lord and and express that in baptism through the the ministry of this church. We have a part in that. And and, and so I, I want you to see the we because we celebrate that and we share that and we serve together in that and we act together. It's a we. Now knowing that, what is your family your life group, your group of friends who share your convictions about Jesus, what are you guys doing together to bring your friends who are broken to Jesus so he can heal them? Do you have a plan? Is it, is it intentional? Or have, you, have you been thinking about your friends? See, I, uh, we've challenged this church uh, this way. When we get into our Sweetwater campus, and, and uh, I don't know, it won't be soon enough, but, you know, hopefully it'll be in the next nine weeks we'll get in there because we're nine weeks away from Easter. And, uh, and they said, by Easter we'd be in there. Well, whether they do or not, we're going to keep meeting and worshiping anyway, okay? I just want you to know that. Put your minds at ease. But our goal is, in the first six months we're in our Sweetwater campus, that we want to see 4,000 unchurched people visit our church. Now, the way that's going to happen is if we take hold of that vision and each of us uh, kind of identifies three unchurched friends that we want to invite to come and visit Calvary and and expose them to the truth about Jesus and see whose lives Jesus changes. And, and, And that's the challenge, but it only happens if we take that seriously and we believe that Jesus can change lives. And so we act on that and we see people uh, brought in because it's not something I can do or you can do by ourselves, but it's something that we can do. Because when we believe that Jesus can change lives, we act. We act. We do something. Now, normally this would be where I would uh, just jump off the sermon and finish and wrap it up because that's the last point. And, and that was my plan when I wrote it. But, but I wanted to extend one more challenge because I, I love the fact that, that, that we want to see people come to faith in Christ. And, and, and I've asked you to identify unchurched friends and, and that kind of stuff. But, but here's the question I, that I also want to ask. And it applies to some more than others. What are you going to do to lead your family to Jesus? Because we're all broken and our families are broken and our kids are broken and we want to see them healed and experience that miracle of forgiveness. What are we going to do to bring our families to Jesus? Uh, because faith really starts at home. And, and I want your faith to be visible there more than any other place. Here's why. St- statistics tell us that 80% of the kids who grow up in church will drop out when they become adults. Some for a season, some forever. Some of you were those kids that made your way back. But here's the thing. The deciding factor is whether or not they, they decide to stick with church or whether they, they wander away for a long time is whether or not their parents' faith is authentic and real. Their parents' faith is visible and determined. And so parents, if you've got kids at home especially, 
Are, are you demonstrating that, that Jesus is a priority in your life? Have your kids caught you reading the Bible and praying? Are you praying with them and encouraging them to read the Bible? Uh, is, is church a priority in your life or is it something you drop in on from time to time? Parents, it may mean that you have to change some of your values and that summer camp, youth camp, and mission trips become just as important as sports camps and Disneyland trips. And, and, and I'm not sharing this to, to try and offend or to try and make anyone feel guilty, but just because there's no place that is more important for us to live out our faith than in our families. And I would hate for you to be really effective at bringing some of your unchurched friends to church and lead your family astray. I'd really rather it be the other way around, honestly. The win is if we can do both. But this I know, when we believe that Jesus can change lives, we act. I pray today that Jesus has surprised you. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for the miracle of forgiveness. We know that we don't deserve it, but you have loved us and redeemed us through Jesus Christ. And for that, we're thankful. And Lord, I pray that every person in this room would know your mercy, your grace, your love for them. Some are desperate to know it today. So I pray that your spirit would just move in this place and communicate your grace to them, that they really are forgiven. Lord, there's some of us that, that really want to live lives of visible faith. We want to have a, a faith that's powerful. We want to impact our families, but we just really don't know how to do that. So we need you to teach us. We need you to lead us. We need you to give us courage so that we can follow you, so that we can change the patterns of our life. So, Lord, we yield our lives and ourselves to you, thanking you for your mercy and praying that you would change us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's continue to worship our God.